Hello and welcome back. So this is an EEPROM. This one is 16 kilobits, 2 kilobytes. And this is currently what I'm using to store my program code. And prior to the upgrade is what I was using for my control logic. But these are quite slow and I've been looking at various alternatives. And in researching that I came across something called a diode matrix, which I'd like to talk about. Diode matrices are what have been used in earlier computers for both program store, microcode and bootloader program code. So let's have a look at, at what they actually are. So initially we have a set of data lines and we have a set of addressable lines that, that run perpendicular to those. Each of the intersection points here, while there's no join at the moment, is a location we're going to try and store a bit of data. Now at the moment all of these lines are floating, so we could do this in one of two configurations. We could either pull the data lines low or pull them high. In this case, we're, we're going to pull them high. I'll explain why in a moment. And then for each of these vertical addressing lines, we want some way of, uh, of pulling one of them low with a selection. So now for this, we can use the 74LS138 demultiplexers that in my processor build, I've been using for driving the buses. Now, in this particular matrix that I'm uh, looking at here, I've got I've got 16 vertical lines here, and so I've used two of these demultiplexers, and that will give us four address lines to select those individually. Now, these are three to eight line demultiplexers, so we've got three address lines on them, and so we tie those together, and then we have a fourth address line, which we tie into an active low enable on the first one and an active high enable on the second. So that gives us uh, four address lines, 16 permutations. Now at present all of our data lines in this circuit will be pulled up by these resistors. So then what we do is we actually create our diode matrix by dropping in a diode into each and every one of these junction points. Now if you think about what will happen here is if say this line here is brought low then the current will flow through this column of diodes pulling each of the data lines low. So in order to store data in this, we can remove some of these diodes. So for every diode we've got present here, we're going to pull the line low to a zero. And if we remove the diode, then when the appropriate column is selected, we'll get a, a, a one at that bit location. So we can come along and say knock out this set of diodes, which would uh, spell out this little message here. Now these are quite interesting, these diode matrices. They get used in a variety of places. If, for example, you put a switch on each of the diodes here, you could build a keyboard matrix, which allows you to test the, the values of any of the switches there without any clashes. But in this case, we can formulate what amounts to a, a read-only memory. I'd like to try and build one of these. Okay, so I've got a fresh new breadboard. Now on these breadboards we've got the power lines that run along the top and the bottom and then each of these columns is connected in groups of five. And try as I might looking at this I couldn't work out a neat way to create a matrix of the kind that we want using these breadboards. So I've made a custom breadboard. Now on this breadboard Every other line is cross-connected to one of these inputs and the other lines are connected vertically to the 16 lines down here. Now the soldering on this was very, very tricky. I started off attempting to cut small pieces of insulation sleeve in order to uh, keep things away from one another, but eventually I concluded that it was a lot easier to use the bare wires. That was a lot faster. But even so, this was a little bit tricky. I did record the process of making this breadboard and I'll stick a uh, fast forward with some commentary on the end of this video. I'm also going to add a few notes on what I would do differently in future if I were to ever have to make one of these again. Let's start off by getting our demultiplexers in. Now we've got 
two active low enables and an active high. We're going to use one of these as an address line or the other one low. We've got seven of the eight output lines conveniently in a row here. So that's the first of the eight lines connected up. So the active low enable lines I've pulled down here and then we're going to use this active high one as the fourth address bit on this side. We need to connect these eight output lines from here to these pins. Okay, I'm a bit worried we've got exposed conductors on these loops and on the back of the, the breadboard here. And drop in a little bit of masking tape. Okay, so the free address lines need to be common between these. And the fourth address line is created by connecting the active low here to the active high here. So now these four lines of should formulate the address for output up here. We can use a resistor array for the pull-ups. I believe these are 2.7k ones. Resistance of these pull-ups is going to determine the maximum current drain that we uh, can put, pull through this. And we need to connect all of these to ground. I don't think it would be appropriate to use a resistor array here since we know the current is quite heavily limited here already. I'm sure there's a really good reason for the gaps in these rails, manufacturing convenience or something, but it can be annoying when you're making board layouts. That should do it though. Okay, so. In theory, I think that is the, the diode matrix complete, but we need some way of testing it. Here's a clock circuit. And I've got a 74LS193 counter. If we can uh, hook this into the clock, we should be able to get it to cycle through the inputs. Okay, so master reset needs to be pulled low. Count down needs to rest high. Need the load to be high as well. I want to get some LEDs in so we can see the address. Okay, we're going to be pulling two of the load lines low with that LED but oh sorry with that resistor array but we're not actually using those so it doesn't matter technically we should um, pull unused inputs to one of the, the ground or VCC rails anyway okay so that's zero that's bit one Two and bit three. Let's count up. So plug that into the clock line. Power would be handy. A reset line here in the wrong location. Oh, so there we go, counting away. Now we need to take our K 
account inputs into the address selection lines that are going to drive the ROM. Okay, these LEDs are quite dim, but I don't want to use a lower resistor there because it's pulling the current through the outputs from here. Got a whole bunch of these diodes. So in theory, if I put one of these in, every time we're on address zero, we should see that LED go out. Excellent, that's working. Let's have a play. These are a bit loose in here. I didn't predict that actually. We've got um, not a, a very tight connection here because the leads on these diodes are very, very thin. I have to see what I can do to solve that. So we should be able to make a pattern on here and see it uh, play out. Seem to have a problem on this line here. It never ceases to amaze me how these chips seem to work without power. At the uh, power line there in the wrong place, I'm sure. I'm sure some people watching were screaming that at the monitor. Okay, so that's actually working pretty well. Compared to the uh, creation of this breadboard, that was fairly painless. Should be able to poke as many of these diodes in as I want to create additional little patterns. But obviously the real power of this comes in being able to place whatever data we want in here and then it can be read out arbitrarily. You have to be careful cutting the bottom of these diodes because if you twist the end over at all you can't get it in. Okay well this is quite a simple circuit but I can see quite a lot of uses for it. Certainly the use of the diode matrix based ROMs was quite widespread, particularly in early computers, and they still see occasional uses now. So I'm going to be interested to experiment with these further and see if I can find a use for one in my processor build. See if we can get that full message in here. Now the EE proms, they load in or they put their data out after an address is set after about 150 nanoseconds. Whereas this is going to be the rise time of the or the switch time of the diodes plus the latency on the demultiplexer chips, which I believe with these ones gives us about 25 nanoseconds. So it's going to be substantially quicker. And there are faster versions of this available. Okay, so assuming I didn't make any mistakes, we've encoded up the little ASCII message there. Diode matrix test, which is currently 
flashing its way out of these LEDs. So if you're interested to see the construction of this breadboard, keep watching. If not, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Okay, so I've got this bit of prototyping board and I've got a bunch of these 16-way headers and I'm hoping that I can make a 16 by 16 grid of these and wire it up so I've got an 8 by 16 matrix with the junction points bridging between pairs of these so I can then poke the diodes into them. And I'll either be able to make this work or I'll uh, switch to designing a custom PCB for it. So it's going to be a bit of a nightmare solder job this one I think. Now I figure I can uh, poke one of these headers in here and then plug that into a breadboard to make the 16 connections there and then put one of these headers out of the side for the eight lines that go across. I also think I can hold these in place and get the right spacing by poking one of these headers in. Let's go for two actually. Okay, feels uh, feels pretty good. These headers are going this way, so I need to tack them all in. Put the point tip on here, hoping that will let me uh, aim a bit better. I'm trying to be very conservative with the amount of solder I'm adding here, because I know I'm going to have to uh, bring some more in later when I try and get the wires on. Okay, so that's three points on each secured in now. Let's see what the uh, breadboard should look like. Once again, I'll tack in three points. What I'm doing here is weaving this piece of wire between the pins it needs to connect to. I wish I had some finer gauge wire for this because I think this is a bit too good of a heat sink, this stuff. So the first few on a row are really annoying. But once it gets going, it's not too bad because, of course, all the heat has been travelling up this line. I have to wonder if the pointy tip was the right one for this. It's definitely better for fine aiming. I'm having to carry around a blob of solder just to transfer heat to the pads effectively. Alright, well that's the easy half done. So we've got eight lines across here that will connect to the eight terminals on this header. Okay, I need to pause and uh, recharge the camera at this point, but I'll be back in a little while. Okay, so I'm going to get the header on at the front now. So what I'm trying to do here is cut very short pieces of the sleeve down. So I can protect the wire from the bit it's hopping over. No idea how successful this is going to be, but it seemed like a good idea in theory. Okay, I don't think anyone's going to be applauding the neatness, but I think that's the first row done.
And I've got two out of 16 rows done. That's taken a little while, but that does give me hope that it's possible. But what I'm going to do is see if I can um, make a little wiring rig to help me bend the wires into this loop. Because I've got a sneaking suspicion that will uh, that will help me a lot if the wires are pre-bent and just kind of sit over where they need to be. Okay, I've got a theory this might be a bit easier if I pre-tin all the pads. I found some finer wire which I think might help. I don't know how uh, well it works. This is copper coated aluminium or aluminium depending on where on the in the world you're from. Okay now I've tinned the pads here to go to and I've tried rebending or pre-bending one of these wires to, uh, to, to match the, the stride of, uh, of these connections. We'll see how that works out. Well, the shielding isn't, uh, well, the insulation sleeve isn't surviving this. The solder does like the copper coated wire a lot more than the other stuff. Okay, that actually looks pretty good despite the mess of the insulation. That does make me wonder if I'm just completely wasting my time trying to put the insulation on. Because once those wires are in place, they're not actually going to go anywhere. I might try and 3D print a surround for this or something once I'm done, just to uh, make sure the wires never come under any pressure. Using these uh, pin headers as a guide means they uh, should form into the correct shape. Okay, of everything I've tried so far, this is definitely the better way of doing it. Good feeling to fit to uh, get to the halfway point. This is definitely the best way I've come up with to do this. For if I ever need another one of these, I'm making a custom P PCB. The services online now are so cheap and fast. It's uh, it's awesome. This is a matter of principle now. I've got to finish it. Well, it worked, but the soldering all of this up was very fiddly and it's a little bit messy. So I, I did spend some time thinking about how to do it differently. Now, first and foremost, I think the best thing to do would be to make a custom PCB. I've, uh, I've made a few different PCBs now over the course of my CPU project, and I think I could knock this up in uh, a very short amount of time. And it would be very neat because you could have the horizontal wires on one layer, vertical wires on another, no difficulty in clashing. You can make it a little bit smaller than, uh, than this without all the overlap. And it'd be really quite neat. One other alternative if you want to use off-the-shelf parts is I have noticed looking on eBay, there is a version of these headers with longer pins. So if you were to alternate between long and short pin ones and then get a slightly wider piece of strip board than this 
drop it on top after soldering the horizontal lines, then you could do the vertical lines on the longer pins. That would allow you to avoid all of this hassle with, uh, with trying to skip over the wires. Okay, I think this diode's fallen out from somewhere. That will take me a while to find the spot. I found this very interesting and I've got a plan to, uh, to use one of these for at least a small little corner of my CPU project. So um, expect to see it at some point in the future. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. Goodbye.